Hello and welcome to the fourth lesson in our lead, not lady, <laughs> in our Macbeth GCSE revision series. Um, so if you're going to be sitting the GCSE exams and Macbeth is one of your study texts this year, next year, the year after, whenever, this is probably some pretty good content for you. We're going to be going through all of the key characters in Macbeth, all of the key themes, lots of key quotes for all of those different characters. And we'll be creating, creating some model paragraphs and model answers, that sort of thing as well. So um, in previous weeks so far, we've covered Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, Macduff. Today, we are going to be covering the witches. So uh, yeah, let's just dive in. If you haven't seen any of those uh, episodes on Macbeth, Lady Macbeth or Macduff, highly recommend those, especially if they're characters that you struggle with. Even if they're not, I recommend the video because there's probably something in there that will help you get an extra layer of knowledge about these most likely characters to come up in the exam. So the witches, the witches today. Let's start as usual by talking about who they are, what they are, what they do, that sort of thing. So the witches are effectively three weird sisters that um, for whatever reason decide that they want to corrupt Scotland. And I say whatever reason, the reason that the Jacobean audience would have felt is because witches, witchcraft, the supernatural, all of this stuff, they would have believed belonged fully to Satan, satanic, you know, just trying to destroy the world and, and destroy humanity as best as possible. So that's the reason why they take Macbeth, who is this, you know, fallen hero in the, in the tragic story, right? He's strong, he's respected, even by the king and everyone else, and they corrupt and destroy him by giving him what, what he thinks he wants, which is the throne, even though he doesn't deserve it, and even though he's literally the second or third most wealthy person in Scotland. So if he could have just accepted being almost the top of the hierarchy, he would have been fine. And obviously Lady Macbeth is part of corrupting him as well, and it's himself as well choosing to do these things. They represent evil and sin. As I said, they particularly link to the Christian idea of Satan. This idea is that there's like a hierarchy of evil. Effectively, you've got sort of Satan at the top or the bottom, depending on how you want to look at it. He's the, 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 you know, the author of all lies and evil and stuff. And then you've got certain creatures and, and minions, so to speak, of, of him. So the witches would be seen as one of those evil minions of Satan. And it's interesting because at the end of this play, one of the characters who is attending Macbeth is called Satan, not Satan, uh, S-A-T-N, but instead Satan, S-E-Y-T-O-N, like that. Okay, the Jacobeans would have believed strongly in all of this as well, as I said, and partly because the king, James I, at the time, the sort of very early 1600s, like 1603, 1605 is an estimate of when this is written and performed. Uh, James I was a very Puritan king, and he even wrote a book called Demonology, which was trying to categorize all of the different supernatural beings like witches and wizards and fairies and elves and whatever. So, so there you go, you've got this interesting situation there. Um, the witches are either static antagonists, which means that they're just pure evil and they don't change, you know, they're just, all they're trying to do is create the most damage they possibly can. Or you could see them perhaps as foil characters. So a foil is a character that basically sort of tries to get in the way of the hero. I, uh, and obviously that's what they do, they get in the way of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth by tempting them and telling them that they can be more if they're willing to do bad things and submit to evil. I typically lean more towards the idea that they are really the true antagonists. But what's amazing about Macbeth as a play and what's so, you know, so clever, I suppose you'd say, about the way Shakespeare wrote this is even the heroes are sort of antagonists here, right? Even the even Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, who were like the heroes, kind of the main characters, they're really evil. And the evilness of them comes out. Um, and it's all because of what the witches do. I want to go through some stuff to do with witch 
witchcraft and witches just because I'm not sure that this is taught well enough and so contextually you know it's easy to talk about the witches as evil and corrupt and all that stuff and and that's right but I think that you should also be able to link it to specific witch context so you know around the time that James I was doing this was still the early stages but still there was prominence to witch trials and witch trials were becoming more and more of a thing so what is a witch trial a witch trial is effectively when i think it was something like 90 plus percent of people uh, who were tried as witches were women there were also warlocks which is male witches male witchcraft but the vast majority of cases it was a woman often an older woman in the community often a slightly let's say eccentric woman, a woman who maybe was widowed or not that that makes you eccentric, but just someone who was like slightly on the fringes of the village or possibly someone who was a nuisance for some reason and or just a bit odd. And so, you know, the, the people in the village or the town would say, you know, we suspect this is a witch. Any unusual behavior could have been seen as witchcraft. And there wasn't really any parameters around what was and wasn't witchcraft. And if you were tried as a witch, you probably were going to be killed is the sad thing. There wasn't at all justice to do with this. So I'll just go through a couple of the most famous ways that witches were tried, tried. You know, this is not a fair trial, though. Yeah, and I should actually put trials in inverted commas because they're not really trials. They're not proper justice trials. They would be thrown, they'd be tied up and thrown in the water in a lake, a river, whatever. And if they sank, then they were seen to be innocent, but they would get to die a good Christian death. That's literally what they said. Um, whereas if the witch, witch floated, if the woman floated, then that meant she was guilty. So they would drag her back out of the water and they would burn her at the stake normally. So literally, whether you sank or sank and died or floated, you would then be killed. I don't know which is better. I think both are awful. I'd probably rather just drown than be dragged back out of the water and burnt alive. How hideous is that though? The other one is they would look for witch marks all over the body of the, the person, uh, the, the supposed witch, I want to say victim, ultimately. Um, they would look for marks. So any small mark could be seen as a witch mark. So, you know, I don't know. I, I adopted dogs last week. I've got a little scratch there. You probably can't see it on the camera, actually, but I've got a little scratch there. Um, that could be a witch mark, according to the justice system of the time. So, um, you know, if there was even the smallest blemish somewhere on this person's body, it could be seen as a witch mark. And if, if they decided it was a witch mark, then again, you'd be killed. So very, very unfair. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because the way that the witches are described in Macbeth, there's a lot of paranoia around it right there's a lot of paranoia and and that is the, the 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 extreme evil of the way the characters are presented is meant to reflect that extreme paranoia about witches and witchcraft in the 1600s um witches also had familiar animals so in the very first um scene act one scene one um the first witch says i come gray malkin gray malkin is a black cat so the black cat is a familiar animal, quite often uh, rats and potentially owls and toads were common familiar animals for witches. And people believed that these animals would be able to help the witches to create their spells and create their evil. So they weren't just animals, they were like, you know, supernatural animals with powers and stuff. Um, the witches are also obviously known for potions and spells. So the way that the witches speak uh, throughout the play is in rhythm and rhyme. There's iambic meter normally. So like fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through frog and filthy, yeah. Right, you've got this rhyme and rhythm to that, which was meant to link to the chanting and the spells. In act four, uh, scene one, there's this big cauldron, which is this like big black pot that they're doing these potions and creating magic in. All of this is stuff that, that Jacobean people literally believed was real. Um, and then, obviously, the other thing to do with the witches is that they influenced Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. So that's another big part of them. I actually spent longer than normal on that section. So anyway, lots to say about the witches. So 
let's go into some of the quotes for the witches got quite a few and then as usual we'll try and finish up with a model paragraph so um yeah so one of the first things these are all out of order uh, which is normal for me i try not to just give them to you in chronological order so when the witches first see macbeth they say all hail macbeth hail to the thane of glams all hail macbeth hail to the thane of cordor but the big bit is the all hail bit because this is false hailing, this is false um, celebrating, and this starts the hubris of Macbeth. He likes being called king, he likes being called Thane of Cordor, he likes this power and presence that the witches give him. So even that tiny little quote there is in a nutshell how the witches operate. What they do and this, I suppose, is, is, is what people would have believed about the witches. What they're doing is they're creating um, a false version of the world that the person actually wants to be true. And that's how they tempt, that's how they tempt into evil, right? And that links very strongly to, you know, the, the back ground of the play because this is a time of everyone being christian like 99 plus percent christian nation jacobean england and they would have understood that a lot of the way that satan works is through temptation trying to tempt so right here this idea of all hail macbeth you're going to be king it's that temptation right tempting him to do this um banquo talks about them as weird women i love the alliteration of that and I fear thou played most foully for it. So Banquo is, is the opposite of Macbeth. We see in Banquo the fact that he resists the witches. And the reason why that's important is because Banquo was meant to be an ancestor of James I. So James I watching Macbeth in 1605 or whenever, he would have been really happy to see his ancestor depicted as this like brave moral character who does resist the witches and doesn't give in to their temptations, because they do tempt him. They say that his sons will be kings in the future. I can't think of much that would be more tempting for me than being told that my children were gonna be successful at, at something. I'm probably more likely to do something stupid. I don't think I would kill a king, but still, to, to make a bad decision for the benefit of my children than even for the benefit of me. So there you go. Um, double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. This is just a nice example of that rhythm and rhyme that I was talking about. So double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. You can't help but say that with rhythm and rhyme. So it's this chant-like um, way that they speak. And what's interesting about the chanting is that we see the chant-like sort of rhythm and rhyme in Macbeth in several places, particularly as he's about to kill someone or do something evil. So we'll talk about that in a minute as well through a quote. Um, Nothing in life became him like the leaving of it. Actually, that quote isn't meant to be here, so apologies for that. Fair is foul and foul is fair. This is obviously paradox. It's also juxtaposition. And this is a good way of thinking about the witches. So the witches are a subversion or a flipping or an inversion of morality. So to them, things that are fair, so good, are foul, which is bad. So fair is foul, good is bad, and foul is fair, bad is good, right? So that's their whole mission is to try and flip things around. The Jacobeans believed in the chain of being. So if the chain of being was broken, then in effect, the world does get flipped upside down. And that's what happens in this play as well. Okay, false face must hide what the false heart doth know. This one here is Macbeth, but what we see in this quote is just how Macbeth has been changed, basically, by the witches. Let me just make this a bit smaller. Macbeth has been changed by the witches, and so he's willing to use deception and lies, which is exactly the way that the witches work, deception and lies. So don't think that the witches are the only deceivers. Macbeth is also then becoming a master deceiver in this play. And so is Lady Macbeth, obviously. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Um, it's metaphor as well. So the false face 
you know, this is meant to link to if you're just like putting on a smile and pretending everything's okay when it's not, you're putting on a false face, right? You're lying through your facial expression. And then the false heart, your heart obviously is like your, often we think of it as a symbol of your, like your morality and your, your, your emotions. So if your heart is false, if it's a bad heart, basically, it suggests that they have evil intentions in their heart. They are false people. They are bad people. Um, let not light see my black and deep desires. This also is a parallel to the witches because of the fact that the witches almost always operate in secrecy and darkness. When we first meet them, they're on the heath, right? Like out in the, in the forest, basically on their own. And that's how Macbeth wants to operate now. He wants to be hidden in the shadows, away from everything. Lady Macbeth is tempted by what the witches say as well, to the point that she even asks them to fill her. She says, come spirits, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. I just put come spirits, <laughs> but that's the full quote for you. So she is tempted by the witches as well. And this is the end of her as well. This is her full art. And obviously, what do we see at the end of the play? We see her scared, hallucinating blood on her hands, trying to rub the blood off. We see her carrying a candle everywhere she goes because she is terrified of the darkness by the end of the play. So again, the witches form this use of this moral message. Don't mess with evil. Don't make bad choices. The Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I might fall down or else overleap or in my way, for in my way it lies, little typewriter. So again, this is just showing the impact of the witches, the fact that Macbeth is like thinking about how to overcome Malcolm after Duncan. And he says, okay, either I'm gonna have to basically kill Duncan or I'm gonna have to give up. I'm either gonna have to fall down here and not be king or overleap this, jump over it. A few more. So is that a dagger which I see before me? Another way, obviously, that the witches use their powers is through deception, as I said, and part of that is often hallucination. So Macbeth hallucinates multiple times in the play. The first time is he sees a dagger before him. And the dagger is really interesting because it's obviously symbolic of killing Duncan and it's trying to guide him. So when he hallucinates the dagger and then grabs out for it, it's symbolically him embracing his evil side and going to do this terrible thing of killing Duncan. I said earlier about how sometimes characters like Macbeth mimic or parallel the witches. So here, this is just after the dagger quote, at the end of this soliloquy, Macbeth says, hear it not Duncan, for it is a knell which summons thee to heaven or hell. So a knell is a bell, like a ringing, and there is a ringing bell at this point. It's kind of atmospheric and it's actually probably Lady Macbeth ringing the bell to tell Macbeth it's time to come kill Duncan. But do you see the rhythm and the rhyme? Hear it not Duncan for it is a knell which summons thee to heaven or hell. You've got that right rhythm and knell and hell, you've got the rhyme. So it, it seems that Macbeth is influenced by the witches even here and, and that's part of their power. Another way, I've just realized bonus quote, that he does this, is the first line that Macbeth ever says in the play is so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Who does that remind us of? The witches. What do the witches say at the beginning? Fair is foul and foul is fair. And the first thing that our main character says when he comes in, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. So it links to that corrupting influence of the witches, their supernatural power. Maybe they have such power over him that they're influencing his thoughts even before they meet him. They put awful things into their cauldron. I was saying about the cauldron, they talk about putting the liver of a Jew, so like literally the liver of a Jewish person, the nose of a Turk, so the nose of a Turkish person, and perhaps the most disturbing, the finger of a birth strangled babe. So the finger of a baby, they put this in their cauldron. So I think that's an important quote because it shows how the witches are willing to do anything and they're putting human parts and animal parts into their cauldron. Life means nothing to them. That also links to um, another bonus quote. Here I have a pilot's thumb wrecked as homeward he did come. So in act... 
three, scene three, the witches talk about how they've killed a, a captain of a ship because the captain's wife didn't give one of the witches some chestnuts. Talk about psychopathy, right? Psychopath, which psycho witches. Final quote that I'll say, I think the third witch says this again, this is act four, scene one, when Macbeth comes in, she says, by the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. So there's this irony at the end here, or, of, or not the end, sorry, at this point in the play, because the witches recognize that they have managed to turn Macbeth fully evil. And they even get a prickling in their thumbs based on how evil Macbeth has become. So this is the power of the witches. They start with just this little seed, this little acorn to Macbeth. They're like, hail Macbeth, king of Scotland. They give him that image, they tempt him, then they guide him. And then by this point, they have totally ruined him. They have fully corrupted him. It's not just their fault, it's also his fault for choosing to go down that path, but they give him that pathway. Okay, good. So we've got a few minutes left as usual to do a um, paragraph. How are the witches presented in Macbeth? I'm gonna do how they are a corrupting influence the witches are presented as a powerful corrupting influence in the play. Shakespeare first used this in Act Three, Scene Three, with the quote in a the use of um, the, word, the verb hail has connotations of respect uh, for the person you are speaking to, often with royal connotations. By using this language when meeting with Beth, which is um, tempt him and play into his hamartia, hamartia of hubris. Macbeth is immediately tempted as he desperately says, Stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. Um, the most scary or uh, the most, yeah, scary, intimidating part of this is the fact that the witches seem to be able to tell the characters the exact, um, the exact phrase to tempt them. Um, except Banquo. Later in the play, we see that this corrupting power has totally taken effect. Ironic line, so this is irony. By the pricking of my thumbs, a wicked this way comes in which the wicked thing is Macbeth. To imagine that the witches have fully corrupted this man to the point that they see him as evil shows how good they are at uh, corrupting being a corrupting influence. To the Jacobean audience, this would have been terrifying. And this is significant because the King of England in the early 1600s is the first, even wrote a book on the supernatural 
called Demonology, in which he catalogued and warned people of the dangers of the supernatural, such as witches. Okay, good. So I think we'll leave it there um, for this paragraph. But as usual, do you see how I've done point, evidence, technique? You know, I'm going to write this in. Point, evidence, technique, explanation, read a response, and finally, context. So there's a paragraph. Um, if you have any questions, please comment below. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And um, thanks very much. I'll see you in the next one.